welcome everybody to the Blockchain Research Institute uh, webinar on new directions uh, for government in the second era of the digital age. Uh, we have a great uh, group here today of uh, good friends, and I'm very much looking forward to the to the conver uh, to the conversation. The uh, the webinar um, is uh, pegged to, inspired by, um, a significant report that we did in partnership with the Chamber of Digital Commerce, which is the largest uh, trade association on blockchain in the world, and an affiliate of the BRI. And um, I hope most of you have seen the report. If you haven't, uh, there will be links in this webinar. And also you just go to the blockchainresearchinstitute.org and you'll be able to uh, access it. It's a very significant document, 120 pages. And it's a proposal, um, albeit unsolicited, to the Biden-Harris administration that now's the time to really embrace this new era of technology and to make a turn in terms of uh, what's currently the, the current directions uh, of the federal government, not just in terms of technology in government, but also within the, the economy and within the country. So the context is that the new administration, of course, arrives at a very unique time in history and uh, the global pandemic has exposed and exacerbated um, all kinds of problems uh, in the economy and in society. And it certainly led to this, this um, uh, crushing global uh, recession. And, and all of this is creating a demand pull for some transformation and change. On the other hand, we have the advent of the second era of the digital age with what I refer to as the trivergence of AI, machine learning, the internet of things and blockchain and uh, with data in the center. And this is creating a technology push or an innovation push for change. And um, we, in an initial draft of the paper, I used the word perfect storm and then I backed off that because it's a little overused term, but that's uh, pretty, uh, pretty much uh, what's happening. So um, now's the time to make some big changes. Now, let me just, uh, uh, introduce uh, the panelists here, and then I'll uh, say a couple of things about the report and we'll get right into it. First, I'm delighted that we have Tony Scott, um, who's the CEO of uh, Tony Scott Group, and he's a senior advisor for security and privacy at Patton Boggs, which is a prominent international law firm. And I've known Tony uh, a long time. <laughs> actually don't remember how long, but it goes back to when he was the uh, Chief Technology Officer at General Motors uh, Information System and Services. And prior to that, I've collaborated with Tony uh, when he was at the Walt Disney Company, CIO there. Then he was CIO at Microsoft and CIO at VMware. And um, uh, most recently, he was uh, President uh, Obama's uh, a federal uh, a CIO for the uh, Obama administration, uh, appointed in February of 2015 for the last couple of years. And uh, so, Tony, welcome. Great to have you here. To be here. When, do you know when we met? How long ago was that? <laughs> Boy, uh, I don't recall, Don, um, but uh, it's all been good. That's all oh. I remember. <laughs> Well, it's, uh, was it good for you? It was good for yeah, me, yeah. too, actually. Yeah. And then we have uh, uh, Perry Ann um, Boring, uh, I'm sure many of you know, is the founder and president of the Washington, D.C.-based Chamber of Digital Commerce, which is the largest uh, trade association representing uh, the blockchain industry and is uh, one of the founding um, affiliates uh, uh, and friends of, of the Blockchain Research Institute. Uh, she sits on the OECD uh, Blockchain Expert Policy Advisory Board and uh, has been named among America's top 50 women in tech by Forbes, uh, 10 most influential people in blockchain by Coindesk. And prior to forming the chamber, um, Perry M was a TV host and anchor of an international finance program that aired in more than 100 countries 
uh, to over 650 million viewers. Now, I think we have more than 650 million today on this webinar, but still, Perry, and that was impressive. And um, she uh, has, has been deeply involved in, with the federal government um, as a uh, legislative analyst in the U.S. House of Rep uh, Representatives advising on finance, economics, tax, healthcare policy. And she's also an ad adjunct uh, professor at Georgetown. So Perry Ann, welcome. Thanks, Don. It's great to be here and uh, really excited to uh, release this report. And uh, I agree, we are at a turning point and it's a key opportunity to ensure that North America, but also the Biden and Herod administration in the US get this right. So very invigorated to talk through how they can do that. Great. <clears throat> okay, so the report really outlines five main themes and directions um, and each with a whole number of recommendations. And uh, I'm hoping we, we can get through a couple or maybe even three of them today, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, but the first has to do with technology in the US federal government. And there's a real need to retool government services and service delivery or modernize the IT um, within the federal government to meet world-class standards. A second is that we argue that the new administration needs to make a turn in its attitudes towards digital currencies and digital assets and the whole uh, crypto phenomenon, which is kind of on everybody's mind right now as it uh, skyrockets across the board in, as, as uh, assets. <clears throat> and today, uh, Bitcoin is worth uh, a, a, a trillion dollars. And, uh, and this whole um, industry is, is really on fire right now. And there's a lot of attention. And uh, there are three pieces uh, to this. One is embracing the community type cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. A second is we argue there is a role for corporate cryptocurrencies like Facebook's DM. And thirdly, we think um, that lawmakers should move quickly to, um, to make the United States the first to issue a central bank digital currency, the US digital uh, dollar. Now, um, the third set of priorities has to do with ensuring security, privacy, autonomy of the individual, and basically to enable citizens to uh, capture and own and exploit their own data. The fourth has to do with using technology differently to change the model of democracy. And we argue that there's a specific role for both the president and Vice President Harris in doing this personally. And the third has to do with uh, rebooting America's innovation economy, which really needs to be done now because growth is going to come from smaller companies and from entrepreneurship and innovation. And there's a lot that needs to be done, including to ensure that there's um, a, a diversity of entrepreneurs. So let's start um, on the topic of um, of government and <clears throat> sort of Tony, um, over to you. So um, in, in the report, we argue maybe a little dramatically, but I don't know, not, um, that big investments need to be made here. Uh, nothing short of a sort of a digital mo a Marshall plan to modernize uh, government IT. But um, as I understand it, maybe you could bring us up to date. The president, no doubt having read the report, uh, included uh, $9 billion to do this in the stimulus budget, but it, um, the last that I heard it was cut by uh, Congress. So could you just give us a little background on this, this very simple <laughs> issue of the technology within the US uh, uh, federal government, kind of where it's come from, where it's currently at, and, and just some uh, get us started on discussing where you think it might go. Sure. Well, um, let's start with just some basic fundamentals. Um, the uh, Congress is really in charge of the budget. Um, the president proposes a budget, but then members of the House and the Senate um, are the ones who actually create what's called the authorizations and the appropriations for 
anything that the government does, any spending, whether it's IT or whatever. Uh, currently, the U.S. government spends around $90 billion a year on IT um, uh, annually, um, and uh, it makes it the single largest spender um, of IT dollars anywhere on the planet. Most federal agencies alone would qualify to be in the Fortune 100 based on their spend. So just to give you some idea of the scale of this. Um, of that 90 billion, about 90% of it goes to what is called, uh, uh, or what would commonly be called maintenance spending. That is just keeping the lights on, doing the sort of minimum required sort of uh, thing to uh, keep the systems going. Um, it ex and that number excludes uh, new application development. This would be just patching and, and, and those kinds of things. Um, but let's talk about the sort of uber problem here uh, when you have that kind of a model. Imagine you're a uh, newly appointed CIO in a federal agency or a newly appointed um, uh, uh, agency uh, head. Um, all, these are all political positions that change every few years uh, for the most part. And you come in and you discover that, or you know that you've got two to three, maybe four years to do whatever you set out to do. Um, and your uh, IT department comes to you and says, hey, um, Don, uh, you know, the stuff that we have is really old. It's going to take billions of dollars to fix. Um, and, uh, you know, here's my proposal to do that. And you look at him or her and say, well, where's that money going to come from? Because I'm going to have to go to Congress or go to the president and say, I need, you know, billions of new dollars to, to completely replace what's here. And it just doesn't happen. Um, and uh, what really happens is, agency heads and CIOs know they're there for a few years uh, and then they're going to be gone. So what they do typically, and it's, I'm not criticizing it, but it's throw another layer of paint on top of the cracking, peeling paint that's already there. Um, try to do a little incremental, uh, you know, surface remodeling or um, cosmetic, uh, uh, you know, uh, changes to try to make it look better or work a little bit better. But fundamentally, you're not going to get substantial change through that normal process. At the end of Obama administration, we proposed something called the Technology Modernization Fund. And the idea was borrowed from uh, what the government does uh, for other things, big capital projects. So if a federal agency, for example, needs a new building uh, built, like the FBI would be a recent example, the money to do that's not in the typical operating budget of an agency. Uh, and so they have these working capital funds that Congress has appropriated, appropriated money to, and you can get the money to go build a building, and then you pay the uh, working capital fund back over some number of years. In the case of a building, it could even be decades. And so that's how major projects are funded in the federal government. But typically, that's never been done for IT, which is a fundamental asset of the federal government in theory. So we proposed originally a $3 billion fund. Over the last four years, the Congress has, you know, only found a way to fund it at about 200 million, which is a small drop in the bucket. Biden proposed a 9 billion fund, um, and it was just cut by Senate uh, appropriations uh, staff, and so it's not in the COVID relief bill. But we're working on getting it into some other legislation that could happen later in the year. And this approach is important and I'll end on this because the Technology Modernization Fund um, would work like these building funds that I described earlier in that you'd pay the fund back over time. 
but it has two other uh, values, I think, that are important. And, and by the way, the, the money that was appropriated, the 200 million has had every single project that it funded be successful in terms of being on time, being on budget and fulfilling the mission that it set out to, um, uh, to do. And these applications were developed in uh, really record time. There's three aspects that make a difference. One is it requires you to have a business case um, and explicitly state what the you know, business case is for doing the project. It requires good governance and it requires a commitment on the part of the agency to pay back the fund, uh, even if the project doesn't go uh, successfully or, or get done. And those three things make uh, a big difference compared to the way normal IT projects are done in the federal government where you just get a bunch of money and then you know, you, you move on to the next thing and there's no requirement for accountability or good governance or even a business case in, in most of the uh, traditional projects. So that's a really quick tutorial on where we're at. But, um, I'd say ultimately the biggest problem still in this one, the TMF fund does not address, but, uh, and, and this is why the call for a Marshall-like plan is, I think appropriate. Even if the nine billion gets funded, you still have governance taking place in uh, thousands of little silos across the federal government, yeah. um, agencies and sub agencies and and so on, each with arcane rules about uh, what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do and so on. And that fundamentally has to be addressed um, if the government is going to modernize its relationship with its citizens. Um, and that has to happen. You have to de-silo the information, but still put in place a lot of the safeguards and privacy and other things that um, you know, our citizens are going to require. So uh, multidimensional problem, not easy. Um, <clears throat> I think the report outlines many of the, you know, uh, places where a lot of energy needs to really go. So I'll stop there. Yeah. And well, thank you for that. And uh, of course, I didn't mention that Tony wrote the uh, forward uh, to the report. And we're very grateful for that. You know, um, the, the old acronym uh, CIO uh, was used to stand for uh, career is over. And I think, Tony, you're one of the few <laughs> exceptions to that rule, uh, having been uh, such a distinguished uh, CIO over the years. But I remember um, walking into the office of your predecessor, Vivek Kundra, and you took over from him, and he had mapped all US federal systems sort of, on, a, on his wall, and it covered his wall with very, very tiny writing. And it, it gives you a feeling for the enormity of this uh, of problem, especially when there's no uh, coordinated way of really uh, bringing about changes because of all these silos um, that, uh, that exist. So you can uh, just see what, a, what an overwhelming challenge it is. And I think you're right to point to the issue of governance. Um, to uh, and as being central to even bringing about change. I mean, don't you need you need some kind of mechanism, don't you, to affect change? Assuming that you can get uh, the budget for it. Yes. Well, you know, we used to use this example, but um, there's you know literally thousands of different agencies and sub agencies and groups um, that all fundamentally have the same sort of requirements. So you can imagine, you know, the Marine Mammal Commission is one of those agencies and it's subject to the same sort of rules and uh, everything else uh, as, you know, Health and Human Services, the big agency. Uh, yet the Marine Mammal Commission doesn't have the staff, the resources, the expertise to do, you know, any of the things that, you uh, um, HHS does, and and there's thousands of agencies like that. That and by the way, that have some connection into the rest of the federal government. So one of the things that 
can easily be done is create a set of shared services to allow yeah. the thousands of small agencies to take advantage of, you know, shared services in terms of application security, identity management, all kinds of different things like that. Um, yeah. So that's one cleanup that, you know, on the relative scale of hard things to do versus easy things to do would, uh, you know, create big benefits and cost savings, you know, just as a starter. And then sort of going to Perry Ann here, um, here we have this massive uh, infrastructure, as you point out, Tony, the vast majority of the money sort of goes into just keeping it working, which is kind of true for all large companies and, and uh, uh, governments. And then, so how do you embrace new technologies like the, the, the trivergence of AI and blockchain and the internet of things and so on that we've been talking about? I remember Max Hopper, uh, who you uh, knew as well back at American Airlines. And uh, he used to say that, you know, every, every time I spend a dollar here, I make it worse because I'm building up my legacy. <laughs> How do I create the conditions whereby new investments contribute to a desired future as opposed to perpetuating the past? So Perry Ann, enter blockchain um, and this, this technology, the internet of value as we discussed, that seems to hold a lot of potential for transforming many things about the way that assets are managed within the government and the way that uh, the government operates. Now, I know the chamber is more about policy out there uh, in the economy and regulation and marketplace and so on, but you guys have done some thinking about blockchain within government as well. Could you comment on that or anything that we've talked about so far? Yeah, absolutely. And um, Tony, you make a lot of good points about you know, the need for a tech modernization fund. Uh, when it comes to blockchain specifically, there are a number of challenges facing the U.S. federal government. You talked about the siloed approach where you have many, many, many different agencies that are both looking to use this technology for their own services that they offer to their constituents. And then you also have the policymakers and the regulators who are all asserting jurisdiction over different areas of digital assets and blockchain technology. There is no holistic plan or consistency or formal coordination happening across all of those many different government stakeholders. That's one problem. Another problem is that blockchain, in many instances, it, there's lots of competing priorities. And someone who has worked in, in government, I'm sure Tony saw this as well, um, everyone is overworked, underpaid. There's lots of issues, lots of things that you're responsible for. And if, and if something is not made a priority, the likelihood that there's gonna be a significant strategy underway to address that is, is next to zero. Um, because things move very fast and there's many competing priorities. So we took a lot of that into consideration and in how we are advocating for the acceptance and use of digital assets and blockchain-based technologies at the Chamber of Digital Commerce. And one of the things that we have called for is a national strategy for blockchain technology. We do have a blueprint for that. This is not something new. This is not something novel. This is something that we modeled after what the Clinton and the Gore administration did to help incentivize and encourage the development of the commercialization of the internet, which was a very successful initiative that came from the very top of leadership within government and ultimately helped create what Silicon Valley is today and helped ensure America's leadership in building out the commercialization of the internet, which we still benefit from today, from an economic perspective, from a national security perspective, from a jobs perspective. We see digital assets and blockchain-based technologies as the next era of the internet. And it is going to play a critical role in the digital economy for many generations to come. And it is absolutely essential that the United States is a leader in this piece of the tech of the technology economy. And in, in, in terms of getting there, how do we ensure our preeminence? We need to have a national strategy. And that national strategy needs to include a couple of things. First and foremost, we need to have support 
at the highest levels of government validating the critical importance of digital assets and blockchain technology, a clear statement of support. If you look at the activities coming out of Washington, D.C. today that have to do with digital assets, cryptocurrencies, and blockchain technology, the mass majority of those efforts are enforcement focused. The, the regulators have spent an incredible amount of energy mitigating against the risk of the technology. That's an important thing. I'm not saying we shouldn't be doing that. That is a key part of, of the function of government having a rule of law. You need that for a strong economy, but we're missing the complete opposite side of that, which as protecting against risk, but we also need to ensure we are reaping the benefits of as well, because if not, what is the point? Um, so we also need to ensure that we are encouraging the development of uh, digital assets and blockchain technology in the United States, both in the public and the private sector. So we need that statement of support. And then two, we need a, a national strategy to coordinate all the different stakeholders to have a strategic plan on how to actually make that happen. And there's lots and lots of things that do need to happen. Tony talked about from the technology side, the types of resources and initiatives that are needed to ensure the government has what they need to be at the forefront of this. There's also many things we need to provide the private sector. So businesses and the economic engine of the United States of America is our private sector. So it's absolutely essential that businesses have the clarity they need to operate. There's many areas in law where we don't have regulatory certainty. And those are the types of things that we talk about in depth in the report and also in the chambers National Action Plan for Blockchain, which is included in the report. Um, but just getting to the basics, we need a plan. There's lots of stakeholders. How do you coordinate them? And in terms of establishing that, it comes from the top. We need strong leaders. And we are absolutely calling on President Biden and Vice President Harris to recognize the critical role this technology is going to play and make it a priority in this administration. Yeah, so Tony, um... First of all, any comments on that? But also, if you could address this, uh, I think, important issue that Perry Ann raised, which is that, um, you know, the, the internet is used extensively by the US federal government, of course. Um, but uh, notwithstanding that uh, uh, Al Gore, I think, got a bad rap, as he never said, I invented the internet. Yeah he expressed that the Department of Commerce was actually really important in getting the internet off the ground. I remember back in the early 90s saying every country should have an Al Gore. But, um, but there is a relationship between what the government does in terms of development of innovative technologies in general, um, not just for government, but often it's been for the military through ARPA or more broadly important technologies that could benefit America and what goes on internally in, in terms of uh, a government. So is your, do we have a Department of Commerce today that's doing this kind of uh, innovation and exploring these trivergence uh, uh, technologies in the same way that existed back then? If you could just comment on that in intersection issue. Yeah, I think I think many have commented that, you know, the role between the public and the private sector has shifted a bit over the last, say, 40 or 50 years. It used to be that, you know, there was a lot of government R&D uh, sponsored activities that led to innovations that then, you know, got sort of turned over to the private sector and uh, were the initial roots of many of the things that uh, we talked about, whether it was the internet or uh, even important advances in um, health science or whatever, all used to come from sort of government grants. It's increasingly the case now where uh, not only does do those grants and government sponsored things, uh, you know, cease to exist or are funded at much lower levels, but it's really the case now where government looks to the private sector for sources of innovation and uh, those kinds of things um, and is not in, in many cases, the primary place where uh, those things originate from. So that role has shifted some, but I wanted to comment on, on one thing, um, you know, Perianne mentioned, you know, the focus on the regulatory side 
Um, and that's traditionally been a role of government. Um, uh, and it's an important one, but it's, it's not the only one. And, but there are things that we could even do on the regulatory side that I think would you know, help propel, propel the case forward. Let me do it by analogy. Okay. If you built a gas pipeline or you built a building or you built a bridge, um, you know that maintenance is required on those things that you built. And it, they have a useful life of something. It could be 20 years, 50 years, 70 years, but at some point that thing needs to be replaced or upgraded. Um, when it comes to technology, we don't do that. We don't say this thing has a useful life of 10, 20, you know, five years, seven years or whatever. Um, and frankly, we don't do that in government and historically we've not done it in the private sector either. But one of the things that I did when I was CIO at Microsoft was force our uh, institution to put a useful life on all of the technology that we were using to run Microsoft. And then uh, when things were at the end of their useful life, we budgeted for and required replacement or upgrade of that. And it was a way of scheduling uh, and causing to happen in a very rhythmic fashion you know, the upgrade and replacement and modernization of our critical infrastructure. Um, and I would suggest that the federal government should adopt that same kind of approach, you know, put yeah. a useful life on things. In some ways it doesn't matter what it is, but when it's time is up, get rid of it, upgrade it, replace it and budget for that. And it's a much better way of running things. If you were a an apartment building owner or, uh, you know, the owner of a oil and gas refinery or anything, you would adopt practices like this because it's the most economic way of the most, you know, affordable way uh, of, you know, maximizing the value of that, of those assets that you have. Uh, and certainly blockchain should be a critical part of that. Um, uh, upgrade. There's no question about it in my mind. So that's my quick reaction. Yeah, that's a very practical way to look at it. And when, when we think of critical infrastructure, we're thinking of the roads and the pipes and the bridges. I think it's more of a mindset thing. We're in the 21st century. Critical <laughs> infrastructure needs to include digital infrastructure as well. And I think that's a realization more and more people are coming to today now more than e ever because of how COVID has changed our work environments. You know, we have members of Congress that are conducting hearings on Zoom and on their smartphones. They're doing things they never would have imagined and it's speeding up innovation, but it, it's a mindset of the critical role digital infrastructure and digital technologies are going to play and ensuring we're putting that into practice. And that's a very great way and one example of how to do that. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy to think about, but, you know, people upgrade their iPhones every two or three years, you know, on average. Uh, the latest iPhone has more power than some of the computers that are running big parts of the federal government in cost hundreds of millions of dollars per year to keep in operation. You know, it's oh, just boy. silly, but you know, there's, there's no plan to actually upgrade or replace that because nobody's forcing it to happen. So we you know, think in two and four and six year yeah. term limits. Yeah. It's, it's just a cycles, yeah. crazy paradigm. So. Oh, okay. So let's move. That, this is a great conversation. Of course, could continue. The second set of recommendations has to do with uh, embracing the digital dollar and other uh, cryptocurrencies. And as we pointed out, the two topics are related. All of these topics are related. On the first one, you know, we've got this old industrial age bureaucratic model of government. There's opacity and things move slowly. And, and now we've layered on over the decades all this IT that locks 
us into old models of government. And we have these old models of IT as well. So um, there's been some good progress moving to the cloud, but in terms of um, a lot of these new innovative technologies, not a lot. So, um, so now's the time. Um, perry -Ann, when it comes to uh, digital, uh, the chamber was a wonderful partner and I worked very closely with your folks on the section of the report personally. And um, in it, you talk about a whole, we talk about a whole number of things that we need clear guidance on digital tokens, including currency that uh, America needs uh, guidance on the tax tre treatment of digital things of value, um, that there are all kinds of opportunities to use blockchain to deter money laundering, improve sanctions compliance, and so on, that we have to have a, a streamlining of oversight uh, uh, of the industry, and uh, overall, that the government needs to recognize the economic significance of blockchain. So. Could you uh, just take a couple of minutes here and sort of characterize where we're currently at and what are the big things in your mind about what needs to be done um, out there in the market and in the economy in terms of this technology? Yeah, we could definitely have an entire day worth of briefings just on that yeah. topic. So I'll summarize it as quickly as I can. But for, for yeah. digital tokens, just for, first and foremost, all assets, tangible and intangible, tangible could be tokenized so represented in a digital form in tracks trace traded using blockchain technology we are seeing the tokenization of everything right now there's many different areas of regulatory oversight that are applying to different applications and use cases of digital tokens. And you just highlighted a couple of them. The first I'll mention is FinCEN's jurisdiction. So in the, the US Department of Treasury, you have FinCEN, the Financial Crimes um, Enforcement uh, Division. They oversee things like money laundering and the Bank Secrecy Act. There is a number of pieces of guidance that oversee um, uh, anti-money laundering and uh, protecting the financial system. Um, at the end of last year, we saw some very significant rulemakings coming out of FinCEN. The most important thing to note there is that, yes, we need to protect the financial system, and we also need to do so in a way that does not harm the potential innovations and development of this technology. There's a lot of great work happening between the industry and FinCEN on AML, and that is a critical area of compliance and one we absolutely have to get right. So an entire bo body of policy work underway from that perspective. The next agency that I'll highlight is the Securities and Exchange Commission. One of the challenges we have seen for digital tokens is clarifying the uh, regulatory jurisdiction for digital tokens. Are they securities or are they commodities? And where exactly is that line drawn? We do not have that today. The, the Securities and Exchange Commission does need to issue clear guidance, not through enforcement about where those lines lie. And then for those who, for those tokens who do want to operate as, as a digital security, we need additional guidance around things like custody and uh, a pathway for exchange traded products and other SEC regulated financial products. Um, and then we also talked about tax. So digital assets are considered property for tax purposes. We do need clear guidance from the IRS that's principles-based that promotes compliance. There's a lot of questions many businesses have about how to make sure they are in compliance with the law. And the IRS has some policy making to do to ensure businesses have what they need to ensure they're doing things the right way. So just kind of to summarize there, you have FinCEN who's regulating um, this technology and tokens as currencies. And then you have the SEC that's regulating tokens that would be considered a security. Then you also have the CFTC that would regulate commodities and then IRS that's taxing them as property. So four different agencies, four different regimes 
yeah. four different organizations that need to coordinate to make sure we have a clear roadmap for businesses to operate in a safe and compliance way that helps incentivize the growth and development of these important innovations. Well, all that sounds <clears throat> quite straightforward, really, and straightening out. Um, again, the, the precondition for all of that is just basic knowledge by these regulators. Now, there are some in the last month, some bad things have happened and good things have happened on that front. I mean, we have Janet Yellen, who has made this extraordinary statement that a majority, from what she can see, of Bitcoin transactions are for uh, nefarious purposes and criminal behavior and terrorism and so on, which is just factually incorrect. But on the other hand, you have, um, we'll see what happens. Somebody like Gary Gensler has been uh, appointed as, or being appointed as the chairman of the SEC. And he's somebody who taught, has been teaching a course at MIT on blockchain. I know because they use our book and my TED talk and other stuff in that course. So uh, he's certainly somebody that's knowledgeable. But one of the things that we've been saying, and Tony, you might refer to the or uh, comment on this too, is that we just need to, um, an awakening here that IT is not what we think it is traditionally, and that there that the technology is entering a second age, and this technology is very, very different. The way that you think about it differently, and the kinds of opportunities it addresses. Tony, you were referring to making a business case. You know that this is a real challenge. A traditional business case has tended to focus on cost displacement or. Um, um, you know, efficiency and so on, when many of the biggest opportunities now are transforming the way that uh, that services are, are delivered, the, the kinds of services that are possible and so on. So um, I don't think that was a question. Uh, Tony, <laughs> yeah, well, did but you want to comment on it? I, I do, because I think we've had, you know, um, this uh, COVID crisis has really acted as an accelerant for the digitization of almost everything. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Government's kind of the one exception uh, to some degree at this point, although I'll say even the federal government adopted the work from home and all of that kind of stuff that uh, most commercial enterprises have. But it, in every other aspect of our lives, COVID has acted as an accelerant. And I'm predicting that as we come out of that, we're not going to go back to the way we were fully. I, I can guarantee that. And yeah. there's a whole bunch of businesses that didn't transform themselves quickly or quickly enough that are either already out of business or will soon go out of business for failure to adopt uh, and adapt to this uh, new world, the new newer digital world that we live in. Um, and and so I think we shouldn't waste that opportunity. And I think we should highlight the economic opportunity of uh, and hope that comes from accelerating this even further. Um, so I think there's, uh, we're at a transition point and I think the time is ripe for us to have these important discussions around, you know, come out of this crisis, what kind of a future do we want to build? And it's you know impacting education, it's impacting healthcare, it's impacting you know monetary policy. I mean, there's just no area of our existence that's going to be untouched. I think as we come out of this, so uh, I'm I'm a optimist perpetually. I hope that we seize the opportunity, uh, and I think there's a good business case to be made. Um, it can be more cost effective, it can be more timely, can be more relevant to um, whoever you're trying to serve uh, in whatever you know, business or governmental capacity you're acting in. The, the digital highway is the you know, path that you need to get on and, uh, yeah. and take. So um, we've touched upon two of the five topics. Um, I, and I'd love to, uh, as Perry Ann said, we could talk all day about any one of these, but uh, I'd like to go to some of the questions because there are a ton of them uh, that are coming in and they're quite um, uh, good ones. 
So the first um, actually leads us into the third category. It's from Sirin asking, how do you deal with identity and, and uh, privacy using blockchain? And uh, just to kind of set this up for either of you to comment on, um, in the report, we talk about data being the asset class of the digital age. We create it, but it gets captured by these uh, digital conglomerates, a term um, that we invented about almost 20 years ago in a paper that I co-authored talking about this new species of business that was capturing our, um, our, our, the, the asset of, of the digital age. And um, that, that means that we can't use the data to plan our lives, we can't monetize it and they're getting rich and there's this huge bifurcation of wealth uh, that's occurring in the economy with the con um, you know, there's wealth creation, but the, there's pro even pre-pandemic, the prosperity tends to be declining for the uh, majority of, of the population. And uh, it means that our privacy is undermined and um, people who say, well, Don, get over it. If you got nothing to hide, what's your problem? I think that's foolishness. Privacy is the foundation of freedom. And all this data represents our identities and, and we need to get them back so that we can manage our identities responsibly for ourselves. And blockchain uh, can play a big role uh, in doing that. We need to move towards a self-sovereign identity. And this was one of the key recommendations of the report is that the United States could be the first country to do this. Now it's not gonna come about from the federal government decreeing that data will be owned by citizens. It's going to come about in a much more dynamic and molecular way. But the US federal government having a point of view on this and starting to take some steps to facilitate all the activity towards a self-sovereign identity could be uh, a powerful one. Uh, Perry Ann, did you want to comment about blockchain as a platform for this kind of, uh, for identity? Absolutely. And there's a few other questions um, that, that we can probably touch on here um, too. You know, one, one of them being, you know, is it better to adopt public or private chains for government applications and use cases? Um, when, of course, blockchain technology is going to be a critical tool to um, completely transform how our personal identifiable information is stored and shared in a responsible and acceptable way in the digital economy. And that is an incredibly important use case for the industry, one that many, many of our members are at the forefront of and one we have got to implement and get right. And that's gonna enable so many other applications, things like financial inclusion and others. When we look at applying blockchain to specific applications, what I will say is that I do not believe there is going to be one size fits all approach to this technology. Different platforms have been built for many different purposes. And there's at least three generations of blockchain technology that are available in the market today. The first generation being Bitcoin, when it comes to a store of value, Bitcoin has really prevailed as a key tool for wealth generation and preservation. Two on smart contracts, Ethereum was the second generation to pioneer and enable that application. And now we're seeing a third generation where you have more of an enterprise um, uh, scale and throughput capacity to meet the demands of, of business and corporations and governments today. So when we look to implement this technology, you have to first look at what you're using it for. What is the problem you're trying to solve? What are you trying to accomplish? And there's many different platforms that do many different things that have a variety of different capabilities to them. Um, so I, I think the blockchain economy is going to have many different chains and interoperability is going to be an important part of the success of what that looks like in the long run. Great, in fact, propitiously today, uh, Cosmos, one of these next generation platforms just launched its uh, Stargate uh, initiative, the internet of blockchains. Um, Tony, I, I, I'm sure you wanna comment on that, but I'm gonna throw a couple more questions out here that are uh, related. Uh, so, 
uh, overcoming data silos is traditionally accomplished through greater centralization. How do you make the case for bringing silos through decentralization? Um, it's sort of a paradoxical challenge. And here's uh, that's from uh, uh, Noah. From Emily, the challenge for coordination in federal agencies, their power, uh, the challenge is as their power structure go into different congressional oversight. Uh, what will the impetus uh, be to get those agencies to coordinate and uh, to uh, come to the same conclusion as to what tokens are? Well, it could be more broadly what all kinds of stuff is. Um, they can't be a commodity, money, et cetera, all at the same time. We can't have the, to we can't have the tokens be something different with uh, each oversight activity. And uh, so who will drive this clarification um, versus regulatory oversight and definitions. So you know the problem here, you do a token generation event and, um, and the, um, the, re the, the securities regulators say, well, that's a, that's a security. So you need to uh, treat it as a security. And uh, the tax authorities might say, no, well, you're generating revenue. We wanna tax that as, as uh, revenue. And the commodities, uh, you know, CFTC might say, no, uh, well, that's a currency and these are commodities. And, and so how do you overcome that problem? Yeah, so well, yeah go ahead. Um, just real quick on the clarifying the jurisdiction of digital tokens. There's two places where we, believe we need to have more formal coordination. One is between the SEC and the CFTC. So if a token is a security, it's going to be under the SEC's jurisdiction. If it's not, that means it's going to be a commodity and under the CF CFTC. There is a informal digital asset working group between the SEC and the CFTC today, and they do coordinate. I believe that working group needs to be formalized potentially through an act of Congress, and that that working group should be tasked with coming forward with recommendations on how to clarify the jurisdiction between the two agencies. We're one of the only countries in the world where you have a separate regulator over the futures and derivatives industry commodities. So those two agencies do have to work um, very closely together. And that goes back to that prioritization thing that I talked about. There's many different competing priorities. These are two different agencies. They all have their own mandates. This is an issue that is holding back significant advancements in one of the most important growing ecosystems in the world today. And that specific issue would help so many businesses be able to move forward with what they want to do in this space. So the SEC and the CFTC have got to come forward and work together with a real solution there. The second to address above and beyond that specific issue of the, the, the jurisdiction between the SEC and the CFTC, we should also have an office, a, a general office for blockchain technology. This could be created through an executive order or through other means. When this was done for the internet and that Clinton Gore plan that I mentioned, they put it in the Department of Commerce. This could be there, it could be within the executive office. Uh, there should be a formal office of blockchain technology that is responsible for overseeing our strategic plan for the US's preeminence in this space. And that office would also be required to understand all the different agencies and organizations in the government that are involved in blockchain, what are they doing and help coordinate them and be responsible for executing the plan. That's another way we can make this a, a, a priority. So two yeah. places where we would see a major difference in getting real results to the private sector so they can build responsibly in this space. Tony, you were gonna- Yeah, let me address the, uh, the data silo issue. Um, and let me compare my recommendation, which I'll get to in a minute, to what happens today. Let's say uh, a federal agency, let's say the IRS, needs um, information from the Social Security Administration. Um, how does that happen today? Well, what happens is technology people and lawyers from both agencies get together and they create a... Um, uh, a legal contract and a technical definition of what the interface between those two agencies is going to be that outlines the data to be exchanged, the circumstances under which it can be done, all kinds of different things. 
And then the IT department in both agencies goes off and creates a very narrow interface that specifically and only accomplishes those things. Now let's say the state department comes to um, the social security administration and needs some of the same information. Well, rinse and repeat the same process. Takes forever, it's narrowly tailored, and now you have two very unique interfaces to the Social Security Administration. What if you instead took an approach where you said, I'm going to develop a general API application programming interface to Social Security Administration data, and then I'm going to create um, an easily modified set of rules around how that data can be accessed and by whom. And you could even put in um, a little monetization engine in that API. Now, what you have is a way for any agency that needs Social Security Administration data, easily accessible, um, and you still can create a way where you can conform to whatever rules might need to exist, but you also have a monetization engine to help pay for you know, the costs of, of doing that stuff. Um, I would argue if we did that across all federal agencies that have massive amounts of data uh, and create a reusable API, it would tremendously lower costs, make it much easier to administer and eliminate to some degree this existing problem of all the little silos that we have. Make yeah. it easy when there's a real need for you know, the data to be aggregated in a way that um, could be useful. And you could use blockchain to do this, by the way, to keep track of every single uh, interaction that uh, took place uh, as a historical record. So, uh, you know, the answer is out there. There might be other ways to do it as well, but that's just one practical, uh, you know, thing that we could start doing tomorrow if we had the the plan to do it, to Perry Ann's point. Yeah. So um, our time is uh, pretty much up, but I wanted to give you um, each uh, an opportunity to comment on a last, um, a couple of questions, which really has to do with finding the leadership in this uh, environment where you have traditional cultures, but also where there's partisanship. It was kind of the elephant in the room um, uh, for a conversation like this. And uh, this is a new paradigm that we're talking about, a turn, uh, a new, a whole new generation of technology and governments needing to rethink the use of technology uh, within government, um, um, their, their um, policies and regulations for technology in the economy, and really how to take advantage of this uh, new paradigm in, in the uh, in, in the economy and in the country, and on the one hand, and on the other hand, to mitigate the downside uh, of which there's plenty, and there always is uh, uh, with technology. So how do you make that happen? Jacques says, I'm concerned partisanship can derail this national digital strategy. Uh, what are your thoughts, given the example of the power grid mess happening in the state of Texas after the recent snowstorm? The state had previously declined to participate in the East West Power Grid discussion to um, how can these comp political conflicts basically adversely affect possible digital strategy. And then here's one from Kirsten, <laughs> one our editor in chief, um, uh, saying in our research federal uh, culture kept coming up as a barrier to digital transformation that elected officials have a hard time getting career public services excited about these kinds of changes, what might work, uh, what kinds of incentives. So um, uh, Tony, let's start with you. We'll go to Perry Ann and then I'll wrap it up. I'd say we can't waste a good crisis. Um, and I think this is the crisis moment of our lifetime. But if we don't start to fix these things, there's gonna be even more crises and they're gonna come even quicker. Um, I think we've been complacent as a society, uh, thinking about you know the, the that the way things are is just fine, and we don't need to change. Um, and I think there's a series of things, whether it's COVID, whether it's the economy, whether it's the environment, 
that are all, you know, pointing at us to say, time to do something different. And this is the time. Uh, and it's not going to be easy and it's not going to be done overnight, but we got to, you know, figure out a way to really start moving with a much greater speed and, uh, and energy towards fixing some of these uh, current crises. Yeah, just closing thoughts here. And uh, there's a question about what, what is the risk if we ignore digitization? And I think we risk everything. Think about how important and how prolific the internet is today. The internet was first conceived and was starting to be built in DARPA in the, in the 60s. It wasn't really until the 70s that we started seeing it really being um, commercialized, but it wasn't really until the 90s that people started using it. So it took decades of investment and leadership and businesses to come in to bring this to the masses. We're still in those early days of blockchain, but there's many countries around the world that see how important this technology is and they realize how big of a role it will play in the future. And they are rolling out the red carpet for businesses to move, to leave the US, and they are, to come to their jurisdictions to bring all of that, that brain power and technology so it will benefit their borders. Um, if you look at just one example, if you look at the European Union, they set up the EU um, Blockchain Observatory and Forum. If you go to their website, it's a government hosted website, the very top section of it, it still says this, it's been up for a couple of years. It says, we created this observatory to cement the EU's leadership in blockchain. They want to set the standards and be the global leader and they are putting millions of euros of R&D investments into this space. Look at China, very different approach to any other country. I know, I'm not saying we should emulate what China does or we should be doing what China does, but China, the government of China, I would guess is one of the, if not the biggest investors in blockchain technology today. The president of China has given public statements encouraging everyone to make this a priority and it is part of their five year strategic plan. It is the highest level of priority there. You juxtapose that to the United States and we don't know if blockchain is one word or two or afraid of crypto, we don't know. Meanwhile, everyone's running circles around us and we don't even realize that there's a game, a true game happening and we're not even in it. I think there's a lot to lose. Many nations understand that. And if we don't get our act together soon, this could change our position on the world stage in a way that is not positive. So thank you. The stakes are high and I think we can all agree. And um, new paradigms, are often received with coolness. And as many of you've heard me said, um, vested interests fight against change and leaders of old paradigms have great difficulties embracing the new. And that's one of the great dilemmas, I think, of, of the United States today, both within the government and the massive expenditures and lots of them very sophisticated systems. Um, they are now part of the legacy as are the set of laws and institutions and regulations and structures that are governing um, the extension of uh, a whole new generation of technology into society. So it really comes down to leadership. So I'd like to, uh, first of all, answer one question, which is that uh, a number of you have said, how do I get this report? Uh, or how do I get the, uh, the, the video of this webinar? Uh, you will all receive an email tomorrow with the link to the video and it will be posted publicly on the, uh, on the BRI uh, site um, by tomorrow as well. And you can also help us uh, by, um, uh, by promoting the report and helping us promote the report. So um, I'm not sure what I'm putting up on my screen here, but let me uh, just kind of try that again. Um, this is the report here. And um, here, I'll put the whole screen up. Hopefully I'm not sharing any confidential emails or something, but that's the report. Help us, please tweet, tweet about it. Uh, send it out to anyone who will listen. And um, uh, President Biden, I know that you've been on the webinar and, um, 
uh, I'd be very interested in f having a follow-up conversation with you. We can get Tony and Perry in. If you guys can make yourself available to that, um, uh, we can um, have a follow-up conversation there. And um, please help us uh, make sure that this, uh, that this new digital age is fully exploited and that the huge opportunities are are fulfilled and that we avoid uh, the dark side. Thanks so much for your support for the Blockchain Research Institute. Tony and Perry Ann, that was awesome. And thank you so much for your insights. And uh, let's uh, keep this party going. Bye thank everybody. You. Take care.